Fernando, Paolo, Bacroiso. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Whilst we wait for others to uh, yeah join the session, yeah please, please introduce yourself in the chats. Yeah, name, job title, and organisation where you come from. And um, as this is a lunch, and then I do say, please share what you're having for lunch today. Let's see what people have got, but please post that in the chat, and uh, we'll wait for others to come in the room. Yeah, just to let you know that today's session um, will be recorded and um, made available on our YouTube Lunch and Learn playlist. So if you don't want to be um, yeah, seen on camera, then um, yeah, please switch cameras off. Um, but uh, yeah, very, ha very happy to sort of uh, answer sort of questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we can bring you up on screen as well if you want to ask those questions. But if not, just post those questions into the chat. But we'll, we'll get started in the next minute. Jerk chicken wrap, that sounds very nice, Lisa. Brilliant, OK. Just a few more coming in. Okay. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Seems to have lost the um the presentation. I seem to have accidentally clicked on the stop presentation. Okay, if you can get that back up for me. Thank I'll you. Get that back up now. And I lost my script. I lost all my. <laughs> There you go, Mike. Can you see that now? Yep, I can see that. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, so Prinhandel Pablo Croiso, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the, the fifth session in our brand new Lunch and Learn series, What Does Good Look Like? brought to you by the Centre for Digital Public Services. I'm Mike Erskine, Communications Manager at the CDPS and Chair for this Lunch and Learn series. And today we continue our journey of digital transformation success stories from across the public sector in Wales featuring best practice case studies from health boards to local government and arm's length bodies. So whether you're a seasoned digital professional on, or new to the digital transformation journey, this series promises to equip you with the knowledge and inspiration needed to drive meaningful change in your organisation. This series, we've already featured Swansea Bay University Health Board, Vale of Glamorgan Council, uh, Welsh Revenue Authority. And in our last session a couple of weeks ago, we were welcomed by Linda James and Joe Harvey, um, uh, who gave us some fascinating insights into the digital transformation work at Link Cymru Housing Association and the journey they've been on to bring three paper based nursing homes online. So if you missed that session, don't worry. Um, you can check out that session and all the sessions in our series on our Lunch and Learn YouTube playlist, which um, hopefully, at least if you're able to uh, post a link into the chat to that, that would be that would be great. And for today, we are delighted to be joined by Chris Owen and Ian Vaughan from Neath Port Talbot County Borough Council. Um, for those of you who don't know Chris and Ian, Chris is the Chief Digital Officer and Ian is Digital Transformation Lead. And between the two of them, a um, bit of a double act here. I don't know which one's Ant and which one's Deck out of the two of them, but we'll, we'll soon we'll soon see. But they will be talking about how they are creating the right conditions for success within the council to adapt to an increasingly digital society and how AI and RPA in particular are supporting their business transformation. 
We encourage active participation from our audience, so please feel free to share your questions, insights and experiences in the chat throughout the session, and we will make sure there is time at the end to cover what is said. So without further ado, I will pass you on to Chris and Ian. Welcome both. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, uh, Mike. Pronounced uh, Pau. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Mike said, I'm Chris Owen, the Chief Digital Officer for Neath Albert Council. Uh, very much the warm up act uh, today, though, for uh, for Ian. So uh, I've just got a, a couple of slides to kick off with to uh, sort of set the scene uh, a little bit about what we're, we're doing here in East Batalba and how we're trying to create some uh, conditions for success, really. Um, but for those of you who are, who are not familiar with uh, East Batalbert, um, we're a uh, county borough in uh, South Wales, uh, located between Swansea and Bridgend, with just over uh, 140,000 uh, residents. Uh, we're very much a county that blends industrial heritage with sort of natural beauty, ranging from things like the waterfall uh, country up in the Vale of Neath uh, down to um, the Patalbot Steelworks uh, in, in Patalbot itself. So we, we've got a real diverse uh, county borough here. As a council, I think we are very much on a, on a bit of a journey. Um, we've come a long, long way over the, over the last few years from um, a, 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 a local authority that really just uh, consumes um, IT solutions and services to one that started to really consider how digital data and technology needs to be really embedded in the way the council operates as a fundamental element of, of successful delivery of the council services. Um, everyone on this call will be more than aware of the extreme pressures that uh, public sector budgets are, are under. Um, and we really see um, the opportunities that digital data and technology present to support us uh, with this huge organisational challenge. Um, we've got sort of a few sort of key pieces of the jigsaw that have been coming together uh, here, here in Neath to, uh, to try and uh, build a picture of to what we're actually uh, delivering. And it very much started off with uh, the new target operating model that we brought in probably in about 2022 now where we set out um, some strategic um, structure, if you like, around six key areas to try and put some shape around how we were going to deliver our digital services in the future. So things like the governance arrangements that we put in place, like the digital service standards that we've stood up uh, and we've embedded now across our, our digital teams. We have a digital solutions board that's looking at how we prioritize the pipeline of DDAT activities for the organization. We've got really good engagement back out with the, the service areas to understand what our priorities are and, and how they're being set up. And we very much moved from a very reactive uh, service model to one where we've got full visibility for the first time ever across our whole range of uh, digital uh, programs of work. Now, it's not to say things don't keep coming in from the side because that's inevitable in, in the world that we uh, we operate in. But at least we understand now what the implications and consequences of some of those pieces are. We've done a lot of work around our workforce, uh, really embracing the DDAP profession framework, looking at workplace realignment, looking at where our skills are and doing a gap analysis then against the services and the service catalog that we've got in play to make sure that we have the right skills and expertise to actually deliver the, the services that, that, that we need to, not just today, but, but also in the future. Communication has been a massive one for us to really raise the bar around how we communicate back with the business, keeping them continually involved in, in, our, in our service delivery. Uh, and you know, it goes without saying that open communication is a must have in this space. I won't dwell too much on the other areas such as the environment, the application delivery, but it's around really trying to get away from our sort of technical debt, a lot of the legacy systems, making sure that we're modernizing, we're improving, we're reducing the uh, the data center that we have here uh, in, in Neath um, to, to make sure that we're benefiting from some of the cloud technologies uh, and so on and so forth. So there's been a real buy-in from the organization around that uh, target operating model. We launched our new strategy uh, in July of last year, um, and it really set out, as, as the vision set um, states there, um, the themes, the strategic delivery themes to embrace new approaches and emerge, to emerging technologies to provide our users with the best value, user-centered uh, products and services. That's really what we're all about. It's not just layering more technology um, for the sake of technology, it's about being very strategic, thinking about how we can change our working practices, change the way we operate and um, provide better services. We have four strategic delivery themes, uh, which are using the right technology, um, 
um, using the right infrastructure and we have uh, data and then we have our people. So under those four sort of headings, we have a range of different programs of work then, which are collectively div delivering against the, the council objectives. And then just the final thing I'll, I'll mention quickly is around um, how we're sort of tying this into the wider programs of work within the organization. So we have a corporate plan and within that corporate plan, we have uh, a number of wellbeing objectives, uh, but we also have this uh, program of uh, organizational development, development enablers. And one of those is all around that digital focus. And this is where the I think the real challenge comes into play, um, which is around really trying to drive that cultural shift across service areas, getting them to think differently around uh, technology, not just as, as a means to an end, but actually putting that user at the heart of their service design, at the heart of the service delivery, making sure that everything is geared around that piece. And for us, I think that's the, probably the biggest challenge that we've got at the moment is really affecting that change and, and moving that forward. And it is a whole council shift that's required. It can't just be done in isolation by digital services. It's got to have strong leadership across the organization and, and full buy-in. Otherwise, you're going to really, really struggle to, to, to move forward and create these uh, conditions for success. So I'm going to stop um, rambling on there and, and pass over to Ian, who's going to give you the sort of uh, detail in terms of what we've been doing around uh, robotics and, and artificial intelligence. Ian, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Can you see my screen, everyone? Just make sure the take control is working. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to touch upon AI, but this presentation I'm going to just lead into is more focused on RPA and automation. But it's, it'd be amiss of me to ignore AI because just much as the internet, the World Wide Web transformed everything back in the 90s, this is going to do the same. We just it needs to be done in a in a in a controlled way. But it is going to be a game changer for local government. So it's how we use our technology to deliver outcomes to our to our, our residents and our staff in the most constructive way. But coming on to automation and RPA, and this is really the focus of this of this presentation for me. It's really, really important because what we want to set out to do, or we are setting out to do, is looking at replacing time-consuming, admin-heavy manual processes with better, more efficient automated solutions to drive efficiency savings where possible. As a result of that, it allows our staff to do their the more valued work instead of the mundane repetitive tasks that sometimes that they, they're asked to do. I think sometimes that's often lost in automation and RPA is the staff focus where they sometimes see as a risk, but it, the, the outcomes are often better for the staff as well because they're using their skills in a far different way. So in terms of what we want to achieve, as it says on the slide, everything from savings, increasing capacity, which is really important, especially with the pressures that we're all facing, efficiencies are touched upon, reducing risk where possible as well. When there's lots of duplication and admin heavy processes, risk does increase and also improving that customer experience. And that's really important. Chris mentioned in one of the earlier slides that user centered design that runs through our strategy. And that's really, really important. Sometimes the technology can overtake that part but for Chris and I, that's a key driver. That's a key enabler of what we set out to try and achieve. And in terms of measuring our success, as it says, uh, everything from cash flow savings, quicker processes, improved service delivery, and also how do we refocus our resources? I think that's that's really really important, especially when we've got to try and increase capacity to meet some of the pressures that we're we're looking to. Um, to solve. I love that picture. It's a tight pimple. It was from the 60s or 70s. But technology, very much like it changed the work the workplace there, can often cause conflict. And I touched upon it earlier. And the reason why it's really, really important the staff are taking on the journey with us, it can't be just technology led, is because you get far better buy-in. And, and that's been really, really important for us in our journey of involving them as part of the multidisciplinary team going forward, because technology is changing the way people work, the same as it changed the way the office environment was from that photo to where we are today, and it will continue to do so going forward. 
And those three key pieces of technology are really, really important. And if it was like a virtual toolkit, they are our key tools in, in, in automation, RPA and, and AI, because choosing the right one, and I'll come on to how, how we choose the right one, which is really, really important, will and, will, will and is enabling us to deliver value at pace, and that's really, really important. So I'm just going to take you a few steps back of, of our journey so far. So let's start with RPA. So we created some discovery workshops and staff from across the council attended those workshops. So we had 20 pipeline ideas, processes that were identified. And what we're looking for were really time consuming manual processes that could be improved through automation to generate some of those efficiency savings to streamline operations across the workforce. So we identified 20, which is really, really positive because sometimes it's difficult as well because it's taking staff with you on that journey is really, really important. And as a result of that, further workshops are also in the pipeline to, to uncover where uh, not just RPA, but where automation and AI can come into it. So as a result of those discovery workshops and RPA, we had some suggestions that came in from service areas from across the council. So land charges whenever you buy a property, there's a whole process that goes on that most people don't see, but it's very time consuming, it's very admin heavy, it's very slow. So that was one. Finance, the world of finance and local government is very complicated and there's numerous, numerous facets of it. So there, there were lots in the finance arena, FYs, right through to social services to basic admin like time recording. But not everything is right for RPA either. So it, that's, I think that's an important message here. It's just identifying waste and better pro inefficient process is one thing, but knowing what tool in the toolkit is used then to solve those issues going forward. So in terms of what's best suited for RPA, not as I said earlier, not all are a good fit. Some are too complex. The more complex it is in the world of RPA, the more cost it is, and the longer it takes. And it's picking which of those pathway projects were the right fit for RPA that was really, really important for us, which feeds into that business case then that generates the ROI that we're looking for. And we, from a service design perspective, which is really, really important for me, these are some of the fundamental digital elements, just we park the technology. RPA can also make bad processes quicker. So it's making sure that where possible, process redesign is done as well. And RPA just sits on top of it. So when I mean by process redesign, I'm not talking full service design, but there are streamlining that can be done before RPA sits on top. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through everything in there, but you can you can read through them. They've got to be digital, they've got to be mature, simple decision points, LFIS, FL statements, got to be high volume, they've got to be stable. I think that's often mis overlooked in RPA as well, where if a process changes, the whole thing has to be rewritten. So it has to be a stable process, a digital solution that, that um, is chosen going forward. Let's go back a slide. So this is the really, really exciting thing for, for myself in terms of the results. So the process is one thing, but the, the delivery is everything for me. So as part of our RPA program so far, we've got 12 processes which are live. You can see there in terms of the hours saved, over two, nearly 2,500 hours of staff time saved per annum. Since the program has been running, we saved over 7,000 hours, which is a significant amount of staff time in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, of how we refocus our, our resources to focus on the higher value work. We've got three RPA processes currently in, devel in development. They're estimated to save over 650 hours of staff time. And we've got one RPA process, which we did have in place, but again, in terms of that maturity of things changed, that's been retired, but in its lifetime, which was 18 months, 
save over 13 hours of staff time. But it's also a cost element as well. And you can see some of the infographics there. What we got a lot better I've, in, in East Patel, but going for, from where we were, and Chris mentioned at the start, was playing benefits back to the organisation. That's really, really important. Sometimes IT solutions come in, digital solutions come in, but we're pretty bad at playing them back and, and the benefits back, and that's really, really important. So that's RPA. Automation. Is, all, is often overlooked because RPA is like the cool new tool that the salespeople are selling. Automation is often overlooked, but for me, that gives even bigger bang for you back if, if it's done properly. So again, it's knowing where to choose a process for RPA, when to choose it for automation, or when it needs a complete redesign. So there's, there's, there's three elements of it. For automation, you're looking at more complex workforce complex data analysis. You you can have some flexibility with automation. So it's knowing where and when to, to use certain things. But the results of automation, which will just come on to it, even more impressive. So we've got 34 automations live. So th these automations could be anything from scripts that that's, that's taking the human out, out, out of the loop. But out of those 34 automations, and if you compare that to the RPA, which, which was already impressive, you're going up another few gears here. So we're up to 50,000 hours of staff time per annum, which is an incredible saving. Overall, we're up to 79,000 hours. We're two currently in development, which is going to save another, not far off, 1,300 hours. And we got one retired, which was the free school meals one, which saved nearly 13 hours of staff time. And that was really, really important during the crucial time during COVID of ensuring that the most vulnerable were getting paid on time, the most efficient way. And I think that's the human element is really important with, with this as well, of how we use technology to deliver better outcomes for our residents and staff going forward. You have Notify. We use it a lot for automation in terms of how we use government platforms when it's the right thing to do to send communication out to our residents in a far more efficient and automated way. Whereas before things might have been printed out, stuffed in envelopes, posted out, everything now is seamlessly automated behind the scenes. I'm just going to give you a few examples of some of the automation ones. It was on the previous slide, winter fuel grants. Again, some of the most vulnerable people in our, in, in our communities where we used automation to deliver better outcomes. I mean, touched upon Gov Notify earlier. Sent 16,000 letters out using that, that system, all completely automated. So when somebody applied online, the full end to end was 100% automated. 11,000 residents applied for it. 7,000 of them were automatically paid. No human involvement for automation with the housing benefit system. So in terms of that, that staff saving was was sizable, but it allowed the staff then to deal with the, the more complex cases, which is important. Free school meals I touched upon earlier. SEDS and SAB. There's more acronyms in sometimes in local government than it is in IT and digital, but what I, what I have learned from, from the team was this is a highways automation that they looked at, where, which was applications were being handled manually so that the teams are using automation with them. Again, it was co-designed with them. And that's removed manual data entry and processing the save, saving up to 17 hours a month, 200 a year. The compound part of just these small changes builds momentum and that's, that's really important as well. Sometimes in, in IT digital projects, the big, big bang projects never work. It's building small, delivering a pace. That, that's really, really important because that builds momentum in, in the organization. I mentioned earlier of how we play benefits back to the organization and capturing the baseline. 
there's lots to learn from the private sector and how we can do this better. And that's what we're starting to do. And when you start collating some of the outcomes and the benefits, it is staggering. So in terms of RPA and automation, we saved over 50,000 hours, 53,000 hours actually, in the last 12 months. Cost avoidance savings over a million pounds. In total, 79,000 hours, 41 FTEs. Potential cost avoidance savings to date, 1.6 million pounds. But presenting in a Power BI dashboard just brings, takes that technology layer out of it, but it shows the benefits back to the organisation, which is really, really powerful. Is, should we create a centre of excellence through RPA? What we've done, and what I would recommend, based on my experience so far, is partner with experts for especially in the RPA space, to avoid problems, tap into their expertise. They can help in terms of some of those work, the, the workshops as well, of identifying the right candidates and how, how to scale it across the organisation. Because the people who train and support that RPA team are the team going forward, which is really important. But in terms of the centre of excellence, so th that, that just covers the RPA piece. The centre of excellence, is, again, is a key element. So you've got to create capability in your organisation to enable to, to do some of these results, which I touched upon earlier. So in terms of RPA, we're using enterprise-grade RPA. We're also using things that we've already got in a Microsoft toolkit like Power Automate. And some of those things that are now sent to excellence. We, in terms of my section that they're, they're using that, and also in the automation space as well, they lead that. So that center of excellence of automation is internal. That, that, that's in our control and that's, that's in our digital function to deliver and build. So, Again, key messages, it's really important you build that capability. As impressive as, impressive as, as those numbers are, this is just the start of our journey. So we continue with automation and RPA workshops, developing our automation centre of excellence, which will build our automation roadmap going forward, which, which is going to be important for the organisation to help meet some of the the challenges we're going to face over the next few years. I put innovation time in there because that's really, really important for me. So what I've set my my section, I, I give them time every week to experiment. And it builds that like the startup type in mentality and environment as well to try things, which is really, really important. Because often they it feels like without that space, you're just on the production line. And it gives them that time to experiment and learn and try new things. And the results from that innovation time has been really, really important. And focusing on our organizational needs is, is essential as well. So in conclusion, touched upon it earlier, user-centered, that's why we're all here, delivering better outcomes for our residents and businesses going forward. That's, that, that, that's, for me, that's a given. Closer collaboration with internal and external stakeholders. Internal stakeholders in this journey, they've got to be part of it. The fourth point there is agile multidisciplinary teams. teams. And that's what I mean by that. They are part of that journey. It can't be, given, it can't be done to them. It's got to be done with them. That's really, really important. But the third one is even more important for me going forward because bringing product thinking in, into an organisation, and this will be the same across local government in Wales, UK-wide, and changing the mindset of not just delivering a project, but we're delivering digital products. And so until they're retired, they need to be resourced and maintained properly. And learn from the disruptors, not just in Wales, but the local, um, local government in England and Scotland, but also the private sector as well. So in, in Gartner, they've got fusion teams. The Department of Defence have got shareable information. 
And then th 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 there's a wealth of knowledge out there that, that anyone can learn from. So that's the end of my presentation, Mike. So I'll just pass back over to you for any questions. <clears throat> Fantastic, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chris. Wow, <laughs> those are, those figures, especially if um, yeah, blow me away as well. The the impact that that can have is just exactly what we wanted to you know kind of show and in, in this kind of series, really kind of what yeah, like you said, you know, it's sometimes you know it's not the big bang stuff either. It's that small things done at pace, but look at still the results you're getting. It's um yeah, quite incredible. So um, yeah, do we have some questions coming into the chat? Um, I know um. Chris, you've been on the ball in terms of answering a lot of those in the chat, so um, you've probably taken away a lot of our thing there. But we've got um, Jake. I mean, I don't know if you want to come in here, Jake. You've obviously put some stuff in there about um, some of the stuff that you're you're doing in your line of work. Jake, are you there to to come in? Yeah, I'm here. Yep, yeah. Jake, you'll the floor. I'll give the floor to you. I'll give a bit of context, and um, yeah, if you've got any qu questions for Chris and Ian. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. I'm Jake Atkins, and I'm the senior data engineer in Ramakan and Tap. Um, we've seemed to have taken a, like a different approach where we're trying to move more like processes on prem because we find that the long term costs seem to be better for having them on prem. And I'm just wondering what the reasoning was behind Paul Talbot moving to the cloud. Yeah, thanks, Jake. I, I put a, a feedback in the in, in the chat, um, but I think we were very heavily on prem in our in our data center, and it's obviously cost a lot of money to maintain that infrastructure um, and to just look at the energy and the air conditioning uh, for it was 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 ridiculous. I think we were up to about two hundred and thirty thousand pound a year just just for just for the power for that room. Um, so we had to do something uh, different. We looked to do a full transition to the cloud. Uh, we looked at um, Azure, uh, but similar to yourself, I think the, the costs just didn't stack up for us to do that full sort of migration to, to cloud. So what we've done is a bit of a hybrid approach to it, really, where, where we've had to uh, basically look at what best lends itself to cloud delivery, uh, whether that being because that, that's where the supplier will run their solution from, um, and then capitalized on moving those services to their latest cloud offering. Um, but then also we've modernized what we've got left within our data center and we've been able to get from 25 uh, full racks down to 15 racks, taking well, well over 100K out of the running costs of that. But also then the, the maintenance uh, and operation of it becomes much more streamlined. So we reckon we've we still got a bit more work to do there. We reckon we can get it down to about 10 racks uh, to run the estate that we need um, left, left on prem. Um, but it, it is a real, you've, you've got to do the sort of due diligence around the financials because what looks like a very uh, appetizing statement from from some of the providers in terms of the costs that they uh, they knock about when you get into the detail as you've seen they just don't stack up yeah that's what we found as well brilliant jake i hope that's um yeah i'm just gonna answer your question obviously yeah if um you know if you want to make those connections with um chris and ian after this and um yeah i'm sure we can yeah. we can make help facilitate that for you um you got um yeah obviously ian i know you're looking to uh Question from um, my colleague of ours, um, Stefan, saying about he, how easily can the RPAs you've implemented be done in other local authorities? <laughs> Big question, but yeah, is there a process underway to do this to multiply savings? Yeah, I've, I've answered in the chat, Mike. It, it will depend on the systems and what's quite often the case. Things are done in 22 different ways. So let's come. If everything starts with service design and a, a business workflow that is the same across the 22 then it could be easily replicated but there, there are variations so for me one of my goals is to, to ensure that a common service design rollout is done in Wales because applying for council tax in Neath should be the same as Cardiff, Camarth and Economy. Yeah brilliant. And this might be, I mean, I might be putting um, him on the spot here, but um, our head of tech, uh, Jack Rigby, is in the room and um, it's a good opportunity really to talk about and plug our AI automation, AI community practice. I know you've been working very closely, Jack, with Ian on the um, automation and AI community practice. And it's exactly probably the place where you can start to explore those conversations about how things can be replicated and, and tested across the board. Yeah. So Jack, I'll bring you in. 
yeah, that's ideal. Cheers, Mike. And I'm sure we'll share a link afterwards. But that community practice is open to anybody in the public sector in Wales, exactly as we've been talking about in the chat of if we can take what's been learned in one organisation and move it to the next and people can learn from it no matter where they are on this journey. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach, but you can hear from each other, share that and, and get, get it across into different sessions. If there are any requests for specifics or deeper dives into it, again, just send us a message and we can set up a specific kind of uh, session on that um unfortunately anybody who's not heard about it will have missed this morning's but we've got some recordings that are going out and we're meeting monthly at the minute so nice busy schedule to get involved in we touch on ai as well in a bit so we've got both automation and, and ai so anything that you're interested yeah get in touch with us brilliant thanks jack and i think yeah the one question i had um before we um sort of wrap things up was really just in terms of yeah, playing those uh, coming from a comms um, role, obviously playing the benefits back to the organisation. I mean, how, you know, we talk about working in the open um, when we're talking about working in an agile way. I mean, how open do you and are you as a council in terms of do you have weak notes? Um, how do you communicate those benefits? Um, is it done in a you know a monthly newsletter or do you actually do show and tells um, within the organisation? How does that work, Chris? So it's a bit of a combination of all of the above, really. Mike, the, the team are doing week notes, which we're we're playing back uh, across the organisation. We we do, um, you know, various sort of uh, demos with uh, the teams that are going through the, the development. But I think you know we've taken great steps around things like having full transparency around the programs of work that are currently in flight. So we literally have a, a digital pipeline published on our intranet with all of the projects listed, all of the benefits realization that we're expecting to see as a result of these pieces to make it as open as possible for staff across the organization, but also for our uh, council members to be able to see exactly what, what we're working on. We've just done the, the first um, annual review of our digital strategy, and it's all about projects that have been delivered, all about the benefits, all about the financial savings, et cetera, that, that we've uh, realized on the on the back of those uh, programs of work. And, you know, Ian had it in one of his slides, um, you know, he's pulled together this Power BI dashboard, which pulls together a lot of uh, data on the benefits in terms of cash flow savings, time savings, et cetera. That's now going to be published also alongside the digital pipeline. So we need to get better at it. We need to continually uh, promote the work of the service and, and get them to understand um, the, the, the benefits of, of, of what we're doing here in digital services. If nothing else, then to help justify the fact that actually we need further investment in this space in the organization. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, we've got such pressures financially at the moment within the councils. You know, unfortunately, the, the stock approach is you take 5% off across the board or 10% off across the board, whereas actually there are some services like digital that you can't do that to because you've got to actually bolster that service to realize some of the savings that you need to make in some of those other service areas. So yeah. we're lucky that we're having some real, you know, solid conversations in that space at the moment. We're looking at it strategically. We're not just, you know, approaching things from a very um, sort of top top level, you know, slices across the board. So, you, you know, that's the maturity of the organization, though, and that's the cultural piece that I, that I also mentioned earlier. Fantastic, Chris. That's really good to hear. Really good. Um, brilliant. Well, massive, massive thank you, Chris and Ian. Um, I, I felt inspired and I know if, um, people in the audience feel inspired um, to um, yeah, put some of these um, yeah, learnings to practice or just to ask more questions and find out what's going on. Again, as we said, we've got the community of practice as well. If you want to join that, um, please do. Um, before you go, please do um, Menti um, on your screen there was a Menti a QR code. Please um, give us your feedback from today's session. Really like to know what kind of what your main takeaway was any sort of improvements or learnings, you know, iterations we can make to these lunch and learnings going forward. Um, and um, yeah, and then finally, um, what we've got um, before we uh, wrap up this series, we've got one more session in this series from the National Library of Wales. So we've got Jason Evans, the Open Data Manager um, there, who's going to be talking about the work they're doing in pulling data from across um, the sector in Wales using a wiki base. So, um, this yeah promises to be a sort of a yeah really insightful session in a couple of weeks' time, which will take us up to the summer. And um, we really do hope to continue this series into the autumn. So if you've got any projects that you would like to showcase, um, it doesn't matter how small when it is, um, all smaller projects as um, Ian has shown, um, smaller projects working at pace, then please drop us a line, um, drop us an email at comms at digital public services 
gov.wales and um yeah we'd love to pick up and have those conversations about doing a future session with one of you so yeah. that's the conclusion so again thank you um please give us your feedback and um we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks time thanks again chris and ian all the best everyone have a good afternoon thanks all thank you